Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I am your charming, uh, um, I would say lovely, but that ain't true. Uh, your charming host, at least, uh, Dave Nelson here for ministry cooking classes. And we are doing a, a quarantine kitchen goat hour here today. Okay. I don't know. It ain't a happy hour yet. It's a little early for me. Uh, but uh, uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, um, I'm going to be breaking down a goat. You know, there's a kind of a long story about this. Um, one of our industry cooking classes members, okay, Mr. Steve out there, uh, um, he needed some goat. He threw it out there in the group the other day. And so, uh, hey, I've been wanting to do a whole animal butcher class for industry cooking classes. And it's not really that I want to show you guys how to butcher, although that's not such a weird thing. You know, back in the old days, you know, most every little farmhouse or whatever had a little mini bone saw in their kitchen so they could kind of butcher goats and sheep and things like that as they as they came across the table, right? So it's really not that strange of a concept to butcher a goat or a hog, half a hog or a lamb or something like in your own home. And so um, that's what we're going to be kind of looking at today, really. Um, but the big reason I wanted to do this is uh, besides, you know, somebody, you know, needed it in the group is I wanted to be able to show everybody like where your favorite cuts come from, right? Where do all those steaks come from? What's a flat iron? Where is it? You know, what's a hanger steak? What the heck is that, right? Where does that come from? It's kind of weird, you know, we'll talk about that in a little bit, right? Um, what about a flank steak, right? And the ribeyes and, and, and all of that stuff. That probably sounds a little obvious, right? The ribeye, please say rib, right? You know, but I want to kind of go through all of that um, uh, with, with, you know, the people, right? Because this, this, you know, you go out and order steaks and things like that. You're not really sure where they come from. Another thing is, it's like you go into a butcher shop and it's like, hey, you know, what do I do with this chuck pot roast here, right? Or what do I do with this, you know, leg? What's the best way to prepare that and, and why, you know? So I want to have that conversation. Uh, what you're going to see here is basically the lecture I give to um, prospective culinary students that are hoping to work in kitchens and they kind of need to know how to, you know, bone out a lamb leg or, or you know, uh, uh, break a, a New York strip into steaks, right? And things like that. So we're going to show you where, you know, your big money steaks come from, the real popular ones. We're going to show you a couple of roasts here. I'm going to show you some butcher moves, some butcher tools. Again, um, I am not a butcher. I know just enough about this stuff to kind of get by with this stuff. But I think by the time you are done with this, people, you are going to have a very, very good idea of where your favorite tasty bits come from on an animal. Now, why am I using a goat here? Well, first of all, as I said, our, our buddy Steve, he needed some goat. And so uh, that, that kind of worked into it. But um, basically, when I show you a goat, it's the same thing as showing you a cow or a lamb or a veal. Um, one of the things I talk about is when you see these animals, they are all built kind of along the same lines. They all have a similar chassis, right? And so if I can break down a goat, I can show you what where all the steaks come from, whether it's off of a off of a, a steer or off of a, a veal or or what have you, right? It's all kind of a similar chassis, and that's what we'll kind of see today. Um, uh, so it really doesn't matter whether I use a cow or a goat or whatever, you're still going to see everything. Uh, this morning, I'm going to break this down into some of the larger cuts that you typically see. You're going to see um, what we call the primals today, okay? And so um, uh, uh, an example of a primal is you've heard of the term prime rib, okay? So that is the rib primal. Usually a prime rib traditionally is supposed to be at least prime or uh, uh, a quality as well. And we're also going to talk about that stuff as well, right? So um, pro a, a prime rib or rib primal is an example of a primal, right? Your leg, which we call a round on a beef, right? Um, that is called, that is a primal, right? And so we're going to break down the main primals and we're going to be talking about the primals for lamb and veal and goat, and we're also going to be talking about the primals for beef, and then hog is a whole other set of primals altogether, right? And so uh, I want to kind of keep referring to these different animals as I'm kind of breaking this thing down so you have an idea of these cuts, whether, you know, even though we're looking at a goat, I'm really thinking beef. Right. In culinary school, I used to do this lamb breakdown. They would see half of a hog breakdown like every class, every six weeks. I'm doing this demo for these guys. Um, they would see a hog and they would see a veal leg, a big old, you know, it's just a pretty big chunk of meat, right, for these students and everything. Um, but by the time they kind of go through all of these animals near the end of one of the courses I was teaching, the students would then break a rabbit down. And the rabbit, again, it's based on the same chassis. Here, let me show it to you here, right? It's based on the same chassis. A rabbit looks like a very tiny version of this, right? So after culinary students have seen this breakdown and they've seen a couple of breakdowns, hogs and things like that, they're able to go in and kind of break a rabbit. And we can actually, you know, 
if you break a rabbit down, you can get little tiny versions of those steaks as well. You know, some of them you're not going to actually find like a flank steak. It'd be probably pretty hard to find on a rabbit, but um, uh, uh, something like a uh, tenderloin, I can pull out of a rabbit, right? You can, if you can break a lamb, you, you can break a rabbit and vice versa, really. You, at least you know where the parts are, right? So that's a big idea of this, right? A lot of people, a, a word about goat, okay? A lot of people might think it's weird that I'm using goat here. Oh gosh, man, we don't eat goat. But um, something that most Americans don't know is while, you know, beef is the most popular meat on the planet, pound per pound. Um, if you look at it per capita, more people eat goat on this planet than eat beef, right? Um, the goat eaters on this planet far outnumber the beef eaters. And so it's, it's actually um, not quite so weird to be eating goat. In fact, most people do. Something to think about that, right? And so um, we are going to be eating goat. Goat is uh, uh, an animal that has a pretty darn big flavor. It eats a lot of grass and things like that. And so it develops a pretty big wild flavor, uh, much like lamb does. If you've ever have lamb. Lamb's got a very distinctive taste to it. Um, goat has a very distinctive taste too, and it's not the same as lamb, but it's about that level of strength, if you will, right? That amount of flavor in there, okay? So um, uh, uh, high protein, very lean meat here. Um, it's actually quite delicious, and um, there are many dishes internationally that, that just don't taste right unless you're making it with goat meat, right? And so uh, 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 goat, it's not just for other people. You should try some sometime if you ever see it on a menu. If you are a meat eater, please do try a piece of goat. Um, I think you'll be pleased. If you like lamb, you'll 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 get into this goat. Okay. Um, so let's see, uh, what do I want to do? I want to kind of start looking at this creature and let's start talking about parts. Okay, let me get another sip before we get into this and see who's here. I got Mr. Burt out there. Welcome, welcome, sir. Good to see you. I got Mags out there. Thanks for showing. Um, she wishes she could buy goat locally. I should mention that this is not like a farm raised goat, you know, grass fed from around here. I'm going to just admit it, full disclosure. This is a commodity goat, okay, raised commercially in New Zealand and then shipped over here. I purchased this thing frozen rock solid and had to temper it to where I can even work on it today. I broke this. I should say, let me get a little sip here. Sorry. Ah, God, good thing I got my goat hat on. <clears throat> I should say that uh, um, when I purchased this thing, it was frozen solid and I had to temper it to get it to the, uh, to where I could even work on it. And this is why I broke these classes into two parts. This morning, you're going to see me break this into the primals and then I'm going to continue tempering them in the, in the cooler and um, I'm going to be able to work on them a little bit easier later on. Right now, some of the parts of the meat and the leg and then the shoulder area are still a little bit icy. Okay, and so this morning I'm going to do what I can. We're going to temper the meat a little bit more and we're going to pick it up at four o'clock. And that's when I'm going to take each one of these primals, these larger pieces of meat, and I'm going to start breaking out steaks from them. So you can see little bitty versions of the little porterhouses are so cute, you know, and the little rib, the rack and everything. It's just really, really cute butchery. Okay, and so that's what we're going to see at four o'clock. So let's take a look at what we got right now. Okay, I am going to kind of zoom in and uh, let me scoot things over. <clears throat> Get more in the center here. Yeah. I want to get a little closer to the front of the animal here. And so, of course, this is a goat, okay? Meet your goat, okay? We're not going to name this goat or anything. And uh, I keep finding little goat hairs on this. This is something when you get a whole animal, you'll see a little hair. Let me rinse up a little bit, too. La la la, la la la. Let's see, I had Bert there. I started talking to Bert, and Mr. Sean is out there. Um, let's see, Carl, thanks for showing up, buddy. We are getting ready to tear into this in a little bit, but we're still kind of talking about the basic layout here of a goat. So, as we kind of work our way through this, I'm going to talk about two different sets of primals here, okay? Remember those primals are those larger cuts of meat that I could, I might buy in a restaurant or something and then cut steaks out or something like that, right? And so um, when I'm talking about primals on beef, let's do beef first and then we'll do uh, three other animals at the same time, okay? So when we're looking at primals of beef, the main primal or the first primal up here, I'm just going the, the main primals here from uh, head to tail. The first primal here, we're in the shoulder area on a beef is called chuck, okay? Immediately behind the chuck is this rib section here, and of course we'll call that the rib, okay? Or rib primal, okay? We move on back, 
And this section right here is called the loin. This is where your New York strip or New York steaks would come from, okay? And then right behind the loin, this is where I, I often say, this is the goat's love handles right here, right, right at the hips here. This little piece of meat is the sirloin here. This is a nice little um, uh, value cut right here with tons and tons of flavor. It's coming off of the New York strip up here, basically. So it's got tons and tons of flavor like the New York. It's just not a pretty steak, right? And so those sirloins are one of my go-tos if I want like a nice value steak. So we went from the loin to the sirloin. Sometimes that is all uh, uh, um, called the, the loin, I should say, okay? And, and, and then finally, the fourth primal at the end here, the back end, on a beef, we're still talking beef, this is called the round. The back leg is called a round, okay? So those were the four primals for a beef. It's chuck, the shoulder, rib, the rib, you know, right? Uh, the loin is kind of where you would put a saddle on the animal, basically, that area there. And then right behind that, the back leg is called the round. Okay, um, so let's talk about three different animals, okay? I've got a goat here. The goat primals are the same as veal primals, and they're also the same as lamb primals, okay? And so going down the line with a goat, and we'll refresh your memory about the beef as well. On a beef, this is called chuck. On goat, lamb, and veal, this is called shoulder. Makes sense, because, you know, it is a shoulder, okay? I don't know why we have different primal names for different animals. It just makes me crazy, but it just kind of is what it is, okay? So uh, again, on a beef, that's the chuck. On a, uh, other animals, on normal animals, those are the, called the shoulder, okay? Moving down the line, on the beef, this was called the, um, the rib. On veal, lamb, and goat, this is called the rack. And you've heard of rack of lamb, Okay, and so that's how I remember that rack of lamb. It's also the same on goat, okay? Moving on back, this whole section here, well, I'm sorry. This whole section here on veal, lamb, and uh, um, veal, lamb, and goat, this is called the loin, sometimes called the saddle, okay? But they don't differentiate between that sirloin or, uh, in there, okay? And then finally, when I get back to this back leg on a goat, veal, and lamb, Remember, that was a round on a beef. The back leg on veal, goat, and lamb is simply called leg, like leg of lamb, and that's how I remember that, okay? Um, let's see. I want to go back to that beef. This, this little short loin right in here before you get to the sirloin, that is actually called short loin. I should, I should kind of uh, uh, clarify that, okay? So on a beef, this is the full loin broken down into short loin, and then you have the sirloin there. And I want to kind of talk about the short loin for a second here. The short loin is where you get your big money steaks at a steakhouse, right? There's like, I often talk about five steaks that you typically see at a steakhouse that are your big money steaks. And one of them is the ribeye, and that comes out of the rib section. But um, the, the other four steaks are coming out of that short loin section, okay? And so um, short loin is highly prized at steakhouses. That short loin, let me show you where it is again. It's kind of the stomach area, if you will, this area in here, okay, above the sirloin there, uh, right there, okay, that area right there. Now, this short loin, it has um, filet mignon in it, okay? So if you want a filet mignon, it's got to come out of this piece. Um, it also has a uh, T-bone steak in it. It has a, that's two, it has a New York steak in it, and it also has a porterhouse steak in it. So I'm going to do it this way. Four out of your five big money steaks come out of that short loin area there. And that's why, and, and supply or supply doesn't always meet demand. So this little section right here gets high dollar. There's high demand for that, okay? Um, so we're gonna be looking at some of that very, very shortly, okay? So you can kind of see, I just went over the outside of this chassis, okay? And I went over the primals. Again, for beef, it was chuck, rib, short loin and sirloin, all together a loin. And then you have the round at the end. For veal, goat, and lamb, it is shoulder, rack, shoulder, rack, loin all together, or sometimes saddle, and then you'll have the back legs, not the round, okay? So that's basically the chassis we're looking at, okay? 
I want to kind of talk about the interior here. Let me show you a couple of little things I got to remove um, before I really break this thing down into primals. This will be a pretty short class. Again, I can't dig too deeply into this meat because it's still just a little bit icy and I'm just going to rip things up. Okay, so um, to th this morning it's just primals. Okay, so let me go up to the chuck area here and kind of discuss a few of the other finer points. Okay. Um, what you're seeing here are the front arms, basically, of that, that creature, whether it's a beef or a, a veal or what have you. Um, I'm missing kind of a membrane here, and you can see a little bit of um, uh, uh, scapula sticking out of there, the shoulder blade, right? If you look at the other side of this animal, you don't see that scapula. It's right there as the tip of it, but this membrane is still intact on this side, right? Uh, so what I might do is I'm going to leave this side intact uh, today. Um, I'm going to separate this primal out, leave this side intact, and then what you guys will see a little later on is, um, you know, I'll take off this shank, okay? That's the forearm there, and this is a very, very tough piece, usually uh, um, kind of a uh, 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 slow cooked and things like that, right? But I'll be taking off that shank and that's what we would call a subprimal or, or even um, just a portion cut really is that shank right there, okay? Another thing out front here, if I can kind of point out the chest area here, there's a bunch of meat down here, but it's not very prevalent on a goat, okay? But if we had a beef sitting here, there would be a very large piece of meat right here. This is where your brisket is from, okay? And there's two halves of the brisket. So they've just got this big old waddle out in front of them. You know, when a cow moves around, it's got that big waddle out there. That's the brisket. That's where that's coming from, okay? Uh, looking inside here, do you guys see this little flap of meat right here? Okay, I call it a flap, right? Because there are, you know, three main types of flat meat that we see uh, in animals, okay? And this is one of them. These little flaps here are the skirt stakes hanging in there. And what they are, are um, basically anchors for the lungs right here. The lung has been kind of trimmed away from that. And that is just a muscle that's kind of hanging on there. Let me pull one of those guys out real quick and show it to you, okay? I'm just gonna kind of run along one side here and just kind of pull it on out. And I've got it towards you. Uh, it's always kind of hard to cut because I'm, I'm towards the students. But I'm pulling out this skirt stake. And when you look at a skirt, it looks like a big long belt, basically, if you will. So you can see it right there, okay? And that is what we call a flap meat. And you can see why, okay? That's one of the types of flap meat, okay? So there is a skirt right there. And what we'll do is we'll trim those up. I could pull the other one out real quick. This one is at a better angle for me. And again, they're just little flaps of muscle. And I'm not sure how well you can see this, but I want to talk about the grain of the meat, okay? The grain of the meat here, you can see lines running sideways on a skirt stake, okay? So when I lay them out, let me kind of get them down here. When I lay them out, the grain's running sideways on this. So if I have a, a, a beef one, it's big, right? It's like longer than the widths of my shoulder, and you can really see that. And what you will do is you'll cut these skirts, skirt, skirt, sorry, and there's a membrane on these. There's really not much meat here, but you peel off a membrane. Ah, it's gonna to be too hard to do right here. But as you cook these skirts, they will um, still be pretty tough. Let me get this trimmed up. They'll still be pretty tough because of those long, long muscle fibers in there, okay? So what we do is we cut them into sections after they've been cooked. And then we cut across those muscle fibers. So the muscle fibers are very, very short. And now this is a very tender piece of meat. If you cut this thing wrong, if you cut in the wrong direction, you'll have very, very long pieces of muscle fiber and it's gonna be super, super tough. So when you're cooking steak, uh, skirts and other flat meats, you need to cut across those grains, okay? And you can see the lines going in those. We'll take another look at some other flat meat here in a little while, but I just kind of wanted to point that out. And that's a good, a good, this is kind of a good time to maybe talk a little bit about toughness in meat, okay? Oftentimes I get questions about, oh, what's the, what's the best cut of meat, you know? Well, what are you doing with it, right? There is no best cut. There are cuts that are good with some cooking techniques and 
and, and they would be horrible for other cooking techniques and vice versa, right? And so let's kind of talk about that and put that into perspective. And then I'm gonna get in here and show you where um, the tenderloin is after that, okay? So when I'm talking about toughness in meats, okay, I'm usually looking at a couple of things here. One of them is the amount of exercise a given muscle uh, uh, does in, during its lifetime, right? Like a heart muscle is pumping all its life, right? Heart is very, very tough meat if you've ever tried to cook one, right? Because that muscle is constantly working. Uh, things like legs and front arms and legs, those are holding up the entire body weight of the animal. So those are the muscles that are doing the most work in the lifetime of a goat or a cow or a pig or any other animal, right? And so um, forearms, legs, they tend to be pretty darn tough cuts of meat, right? If you look at the trunk of the animal in between, everything in between here along the back, much like our back, we don't give our back a lot of exercise. And this back area doesn't get a lot of exercise either. So we tend to have pretty tender pieces of meat rolling through this area here. Remember I was talking about the big money steaks earlier. We're coming out of the short loin, all right there. Very, very tender. Also that rib, right? That prime rib, very tender as well. So this section right here is where our tender cuts are and all of that stuff is really great with um, uh, uh, like quick cook methods, quick dry cooking methods, okay? Um, let's see, as I said, the legs, are very, very tough or can be very tough. They get the most work in an animal. And the older an animal gets, the more those muscles are gonna exercise, right? And so they're just gonna get tougher and tougher as an animal gets older. And so um, very, very old animals can be very tough. I recently did a show with a, a rooster that we slaughtered on uh, Amy Gravish's farm a while back. And uh, uh, that was an extremely tough rooster. He was uh, probably a couple of years old and he really, really got tough, right? So the older an animal is, um, the tougher it's gonna be. And the uh, more exercise a muscle gets, the tougher it's gonna be, right? So knowing that, that means if I am up in this like front arm and also shoulder area. Think of all the muscles in your shoulder going different directions, right? Um, they are gonna be really tough meats or uh, muscles in here as well, right? This entire shoulder area, right? All of this stuff up front is excellent for slow cooking, right? Stewing, um, smoking, slow, race, slow roasting, any of those techniques are great for this, right? That stuff also works when we get to the back animal where we have those, whoops, sorry, those tough legs that have been doing all the work uh, the entire animal's life, right? There are also other muscles that, uh, uh, you know, these, these as well work well with slow cooking or slow roasting, things like that, or even just roasting very, very rare, okay? The leg is very, very nice like that. It'll still work with a dry heat method. Okay. Um, there are other areas of the animal that are pretty tough. I mentioned that brisket, it's, it's pretty darn tough, right? Up in the front there. And then also this area here, all of these ribs, I'm sure most people know that the ribs are pretty darn tough. You need to kind of slow cook ribs. It takes a heck of a long time to get them to be tender. But once they are tender and they're just falling off the bone, it's like a meal fit for a king, right? Okay, so um, uh, those rib areas, if you think about your abs and things like that, you've got muscle structures go in every different direction. And um, those muscle st uh, uh, structures are all sheathed in like connective tissue, car collagen and things like that. It's going to be really, really tough in that area too. So when you're looking at ribs or short ribs that might come from this area, those are also really, really nice with slow cooking uh, processes or slow roasting, slow moist cooking, like stewing and braising. Okay. By the way, um, we were talking about primals earlier. This rib section has a name for it, okay? On uh, veal and other animals, it's, it's called a um, veal, goat, it's just called rib, but on a beef, this is called the plate or short plate. And this section here is where you'll get those big old dino ribs, you know, you'll see it like a, 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 a Dickens fair or something like that. Um, and you will also cut these down into shorter sections. And this is where your short ribs come from, all from that short plate right there, that rib section that's just below where the prime rib is. That's where all the meat is right there. And that's just the rib section, the plate. Okay, let's see. So toughness in meat. Long story short, you get into shoulders, front end of the animal here. It's going to be pretty tough, low, slow cooking. This plate area, long, low, slow cooking, okay? And then the back, 
round area, low slow cooking techniques as well, and also quick, ro uh, I'm sorry, um, rare, roasting rare for these back legs, okay? And then your tender cuts, the ones that are good for grilling, sauteing, those quick, fast, dry heat methods, that's gonna be your rib section up here, and then your um, short loin area here. And I should mention, by the way, all of this rib and short loin is one big muscle. That muscle anchors in underneath the sirloin, and that muscle anchors at the front up inside the shoulder. So you've got this big, beautiful, tender muscle running all the way up into the animal and uh, up into the shoulder area there. Okay. All right. So um, what I'm going to do next is we're going to go back into the inside, look into the creature here. And I want to point out the tenderloins, OK? We've got, before we can really see them, we've got a bunch of fat in here. And I want to kind of show you this fat. There's a little bit more right here. This is kind of a dry and crumbly fat. And this is kind of a, a, a fat that kind of cushions the organs in the animal, right, around the, uh, around the organs, OK? Um, this is called cod fat and things like lamb and goat. Very, very crumbly dry fat in a beef animal. This is called suet, if you've ever heard of suet. And it's highly prized for like um, savory baking applications and things like that. Um, it's a very dry, hard, crumbly fat. It makes really good like pie crust, pate crusts and things like that, right? So that's cod fat. And you'll see that in this area around where the organs are in the animal, okay? Now, right the underneath all of this cod fat and all of that. Let me cut a little bit more out here, uh, just so you guys can see. And it's always a strange angle to try and butcher demo so you guys can see it. All right, so right there, you can see two muscles there and they're super soft, okay? They're really, really soft muscle. Um, animals have them in different areas of their body sometimes, um, but uh, those are your tenderloins, okay? What they are is kind of a long tadpole shaped muscle that tapers down the tail of the tadpole would be towards the front and the head of the tadpole is down inside the leg. I gotta go digging for that. Okay. Now there's a, uh, I almost said a tadpole. There's a tenderloin on both sides of the spine and the tenderloin is inside where all the guts are. It's not doing a lot of work there. And so that's why it's super, super tender. I'm going to cut one tenderloin out so we can look at what a tenderloin looks like. Just a baby one. Okay. But the other one I want to leave in because as I break down this primal later on, I want to be able to show you porterhouses and T-bones. And I can't do that if I pull the tenderloin out of the other side of this. Okay. So we're going to pull out one tenderloin for now and lay it on down. And then the other one is going to get cut into uh, some steaks later on. Okay, so let me get the camera back on that tenderloin, and you can see it is riding right along the spine. There's a tenderloin on both sides, and let me just back up. There's also a little blob of meat right here, okay, and what that was supposed to be, it looks like it got removed. That's the hanger steak right there. You see how in the inside of the animal, it's just kind of hanging down there. It's just a little blob. What it is is a muscle that kind of connects your kidneys and your liver and things like that. Your organs are kind of connected to it. So it's just an anchor. And that hanger steak, if you've never had one before, it eats like steak, but it tastes like liver. It's got a big irony taste to it, okay? So if you've never had hanger steak, uh, um, check it out sometime, if, especially if you're into those awful meats, okay? But I'm just going to pull this little teeny bit of a hanger off. They didn't really give me a big one to show you. By the way, the hanger steak has a big old piece of connected tissue in it that's very, very tough. So that's just a little nub of a hanger steak right there. They didn't leave me the whole thing. But there is very heavy connective tissue in that thing that you need to trim out. And it's kind of a two-sided little steak. Okay, so there's a tiny piece of hanger out there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and trim a little more fat and membrane just so you guys can see. A little more of that cod fat was in there. And I think I've got this tenderloin pretty well exposed here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight in. And I've got a knife here. Actually, I like to use a more of a flexible blade for this one. So let me pull a flexi knife out. This guy has a little bit more flex to him. And I'm gonna just run that right along the spine. And as I do, as I do, I'm flexing the blade down against that bone. So there's a little pressure going down, okay? I wanna get right up against that tenderloin. 
and it's super, super soft meat. You can really easily tear this stuff up. So let me kind of uh, separate the uh, tail of this thing a little bit. Here it goes. And so now you can see that the tail has been freed up, right? It was laying right in there. So I'm moving forward on this guy. Again, it's a funny angle just because I'm trying to make sure everybody can see. And now I'm going for the head of this thing. tip of it. It's anchored right there. And it's a very, very small tenderloin. I think I, got, oh, I lost a little bit of that head in there. Now, one thing on this tenderloin, this is a very tiny, tiny version of this, okay? On a beef, it's going to be, well, wider than the camera can see, right? I'll step back. On a beef, they're about so long, okay? Big old knobby head, and then it tapers down to the other end, okay? Um, so my head was up here. I left a little bit back in the round there, buried in there. But the head is right there. And along the side here is a bit of muscle with connective tissue. You guys see that kind of coming off of there? It's separating off of there. This side muscle on a big old beef would be called the chain, okay? Chain, chain, chain. It's still attached by a membrane, still attached, okay? I'm just kind of separating it from, with my finger here, basically. But uh, I think I'll just cut it. Zip and zip, okay? Now that chain has a lot of connective tissue in there. People will just throw this into a grinder or something and that will, connective tissue will just instantly uh, clog up your grinder. So you, you wanna go through there. If you wanna try and salvage meat out of this, you've gotta kind of just kind of pull it on out of there. I got a funny angle again. Working in my little baby crappy kitchen here, okay? So you'll go through that chain and try and just salvage any meat you can out of that thing. I'll just throw that in my scrap pile. You guys get the idea about the chain. This ain't about the chain, it's about the tenderloin, okay? Now on the tenderloin, you can see that there's a membrane on the surface of this. And this is something that we call silver skin. Some of you may have heard that term, right? And this silver skin, super, super tough. This will not cook down with slow cooking. It has to be removed, okay? I'm gonna move my goat out of the way so I can do this properly. This is better. Oh, now I can work. <sighs> Thanks, everybody. Who's out there? Mr. Arturo's out there. Mr. Abraham, an old student of mine. Looking good, brother? Melissa's out there. Patrice, another old student. Looking good. Let's take a look at this. Uh, look at this tenderloin now, okay? Again, a beef would be much bigger, right? But I've got this uh, um, silver skin on here, and the way that a butcher will remove that, I'm kind of do a little zips here. thing is like I got to stick it to the counter here because it's so lightweight. What we do is we get underneath that silver skin or whatever membrane with the tip of our knife and we make a little tab on that, okay? So I just kind of made a little tab and now I'm holding onto that tab. You guys all see that? It's very tiny, I know. I told you everything was going to be mini today. Now I pull that tab straight outward in that direction, not upward, straight out and I shave that membrane right on out of there. It's uh, really, really lightweight. So I'm trying to stick the tenderloin to the board with my hand while I'm doing this. Anyway, we just zip that on out and there goes the membrane, okay? That wouldn't be able to cook out, cook and get tender. So we remove that stuff. We'll go through the whole tenderloin, make it all nice. And then uh, um, later on, we cut that into steaks. I think I'll save that for uh, later and cut that into steaks. Ah, we'll do it now. Let's do our fillets now. When I am uh, cutting up a tenderloin, okay, that's what we have right now. This isn't a filet mignon net yet. Uh, when I'm cutting up a tenderloin, I can get three basic cuts out of a tenderloin, right? And uh, I should mention, you know, butchers have different names in different parts of the country, right? So a Chateaubriand here might be, you know, a London broil in another place or things like that. But um, as far as my, most chefs 
I know the chef languages. We're getting our Chateaubriand. We're getting our tenderloin. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. We're getting our Chateaubriand and fillets and, and things like that. It's out of tenderloin, basically. Okay. So um, let's see. If I'm working with a tenderloin, again, usually kind of a knobby head right there. I'm just going to trim this. But if I'm cutting a filet mignon out of this thing, I'm simply cutting a steak straight across. On a beef, this steak is going to be the size of my fist, right? And I just stand that guy up, and that is a tiny little filet mignon, okay? I'm going to lay that down right next to this tenderloin. Again, when we started with the whole muscle, it's called a tenderloin, and I just cut a filet mignon out of that, right? Now, I can cut a double size filet mignon for two, and we'll cook it up and carve it in the dining room, and that's what we call a Chateaubriand. So a Chateaubriand is a double size um, filet mignon, roasted off or pan roasted basically, taken out in the dining room, carved up by one of those snooty French waiters on his solid gold cart or whatever, you know, and uh, that's your Chateaubriand basically. And then another cut out of the tenderloin, we're all, we're still talking about that tenderloin, right, is a half size of filet mignon, right? I don't like a filet mignon. It's a really hard steak to cook, especially if you want like a medium or something or anything like that. It's just gonna dry out. There's not a lot of marbling. I'm standing him up, right? Um, so when I do filet, I like to eat it um, in medallions. I like very, very thin pieces, super hot pan, sh sh real quick sear, and then I eat it up and it's really, really nice. That's about the only way I wanna eat filet mignon. Uh, so when I cut it into those smaller pieces, those are called medallions, okay? So I'm gonna cut a couple of medallions and then we'll review tenderloin, okay? So a medallion is a half size filet. I didn't cut that first one very clean. And by the way, when you're cutting steaks, boy, he's a mess. When you're cutting steaks, you want long, smooth strokes. You want clean faces on the steaks that you cut, right? So basically, I've got a Chateaubriand, a very tiny one. I've got a filet mignon, and I've got a couple of medallions that won't lay flat. You guys get the idea? Okay. I told you I was just going to make many versions of all these steaks. Again, these all came out of the tenderloin, three cuts that you get out of the tenderloin typically. And if I order Chateaubriand on a menu, I'm typically thinking it's going to be a piece of tenderloin in my, in my world. All right, so that's the tenderloin. Let's bring this uh, uh, little fella on back here, and we're going to um, start breaking this goat into primals. I, I pulled out a tenderloin. Uh, again, I'm going to just leave one tenderloin in for purposes, uh, but the other one I wanted to pull out and show you that little little thing I just showed you. Let's let's get this guy back over here. Let's see who's here, Mr. Nate Son, and welcome, sir. Always a pleasure. I got a little uh, a little sip here, and we got this goat ready to throw down. All right. So we're going to start at the front of the goat and move our way back. I want to wash up again real quick. If you are uh, curious about where I got this goat, um, I mentioned earlier that this is just a, uh, a commodity goat here, nothing fancy, and I wound up just getting it at Restaurant Depot, okay? Uh, um, just, uh, uh, you know, this is a 25-pound goat, by the way. It cost me about three bucks a pound. It will probably yield about 50% of this goat. I usually see numbers like 45 to 55%. Hey, that's about 50 to me, okay? So uh, about half of this is going to be fat and bone, and half of it will be clean meat that's ready to go. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, I am going to start at the chuck area, okay? Now, this section here is still a little bit frozen. I can't really dig too deeply into here, but I did want to kind of pull one arm off of this animal. I'm going to leave the other one on. Uh, I'm not sure if I can, yeah, I think this will work. I, I wanted to kind of show you how easily these arms come off of here. Um, basically, when you're looking at these animals' shoulders, there's no ball and socket. It's basically all just held on by muscle and, and sinew and things like that. It's kind of interesting. So I wanted to kind of show you what that looks like. Um, basically, I just kind of make one little slit in the armpit area, and I can almost it's, it's like completely open in there. I can just kind of start sticking my hand in there. He's still pretty frozen inside. 
but there's really not much holding this, this shoulder on here, okay? I'm just gonna kind of follow uh, uh, the, uh, I'm gonna cut through the scapula a little bit here. There we go. I'm gonna leave a little scapula on the rest of this guy. But I just wanted to show you, there's really not a heck of a lot holding this all together. Now, what I'm doing is following a seam here. And when butchers are kind of breaking down an animal, that's what we're calling it. We're calling it seaming. And you can kind of see that I am just following a seam, a natural seam in here. It's like nature tells me exactly where to cut, okay? And you can see I'm really just mostly wrenching on this thing. Again, no ball and socket uh, uh, assembly or anything like that. It's almost off. And you'll be able to kind of see what that looks like, okay? Okay, so I just pulled off that front arm and I'm gonna kind of break this guy down later. Uh, um, one of the cuts that I like out of this piece is the flat iron stake. So I wanna show you what that looks like, where that comes from. Uh, basically, I'll just tell you, it's laying right on top of this shoulder blade right here, okay? So you'll be seeing that a little bit later on. I'm gonna set that on down. And uh, now I'm just gonna go ahead and separate this, uh, uh, the um, shoulder primal from the rack primal, okay? So the way I do this is I am separating between the fourth and fifth rib. So I tend to, you know, when I'm doing this, I tend to go in there and I count the ribs. I'm not looking, I'm just feeling them. So there's one, wait, there's one, two, three, and then I just passed four and now I'm on to five. So I'm gonna go ahead and stick my knife in there. I'm gonna cut both ways up towards the rib. And I've got a hard sternum up here that I can't cut through with my knife, okay? So uh, fourth and fifth rib on that side. Let me make sure I kind of got down there. Yeah. And then I'm gonna count the fourth and fifth rib on the other side. So there's one, two, three, three, four. And I'm going through and I'll pop it out the other side. Boop. Ah. So I'm hitting that scapula right there, kind of come up, and there it is right there. There's the line I'm going to be cut. All right, so um, earlier I said, hey, back in the day, a lot of farmhouses had their own bone saw. I'm going to bust out mine. Uh, just a little story about my bone saw here. Um, my great, great grandfather was a, uh, uh, he was a butcher. But he, in his heart, he was really a gold miner. And every time he got off from the butcher shop, he was out there mining gold or whatever. And if he didn't make enough money mining gold, he had to go back and butcher a little bit, okay? Um, I've got his old saw here, and that's what I'm using. This thing weighs a ton. It's an old French cast, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, carbon steel saw or whatever. But um, it still works. I went and slapped a modern blade on this thing, and it's, uh, uh, it, it's a simple design. They haven't changed it in all these years all that much. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna start out by going through the sternum here, very simple. By the way, these are made for going through bone and flesh. So if you're ever playing with one of these, uh, it's no joke. Kind of went through that. And one thing to kind of uh, make clear here is, notice I made cuts on the meat with my knife and then the bone saw is just for bone alone. Um, if I get back into meat, I switch back to my knife, the bone saw will tear up the meat, okay? So now I gotta cut through that scapula a little bit. Now I'm into the spine. And now that's all the way through. Now let me kind of clean up the face of this real quick and show you what I got. Now this is, I'm holding onto the shoulder on a beef. This would call, be called the chuck, okay? And you can basically see the ridge of the spine running straight upward here and the outline of lamb chops right there, okay? Really? Earlier I was saying we can get a flat iron out of this um, uh, chuck area. That's a very, very tender steak. In fact, some may say the, uh, some say the second most tender muscle, muscle in the animal. Yeah. That is another beautiful little steak there. And you, you get those out and we call those a Delmonico. Okay, a beautiful little steak. It's basically ribeye meat that's inside of all of this toughness, okay? Beautiful stuff right there. I'm gonna set this primal aside. And uh, I think what I will do is everything from the front is going onto one tray. Everything from the chuck. Okay, so let me kind of clean up this area here. And I wanna show you the front end of the rib. 
So this is where I just kind of cut. Excuse me. So there's the area that matched up with the chuck or shoulder that I just cut off of there. I'm using a towel to get the bone dust off of there where I use that saw, okay? And again, I cut in between the fourth and fifth rib to get this um, rib section started here, okay? Uh, on goat, I should say the rack section, okay? Now, what I do now is I go down to the um, 12th and 13th rib. There's only 13 ribs in these guys. And so we go between the 12th and 13th rib. That's gonna leave one rib on the back end of this thing. The rest of the ribs are coming off with this piece here. So I'm gonna get my knife and I'm gonna just count from the last rib and I'm just gonna place that knife in the slot between the last rib and the one next to it. And this one, I don't need a saw yet. It just comes right up. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. There's only one rib left. Poke it on through, poke on through to the other side. And then I'm gonna get my little bone slot, bone saw McGraw here. And I'm gonna cut through that spine. That was easy. And this is my rack, okay? If I wanted to French this rack, this thing, you know, uh, I got to do some more cutting here. This thing's getting really soft and pliable, and that's not how you want to work it. So again, I'm going to chill these guys during the afternoon and come back with this stuff nice and firm so I can work on it and show you how to cut a nice uh, set of racks out of there, okay? By the way, this has got to be split down the center too. There's some, there's some work to do on this fella. So I'm going to set this one aside for later. And next, we're going to take out our short loin on a beef, short loin would be about there. And then here's the sirloin. I'm basically just gonna kind of cut all of this off in one piece here, okay? And we're just gonna call this the loin and we're gonna call this the round back here, okay? The loin and the round. So at this point, I kind of feel for the hip joint. It is right there and I'm gonna make my cut just below that hip joint right there, okay? So here, I'm trying to save as much of the uh, meat up here as I can. I'm going to lose a little bit there. And I'm going to do the same here. I'm feeling for that joint, and I'm cutting right below it. What am I looking at? Now I got it. And now I'm going to grab my saw. And go right through that. Get that very straight. Oh yeah. This one's a little uh, heavier bone. Give it a little snap a -roo. I think I got through it. And now I can grab my knife and head on through again. Get the rest. And there she is. Oh, that could have been a little cleaner. So there I have my short loin up here. And then I have my sirloin down here. And that's going to take a little cleanup. I'll show you that later. Uh, what I'll probably do is just pull out the New York strip. And then also, on one side, I still have that filet mignon, or that tenderloin, I'm sorry, laying in there. And when I cut this section into steaks, that's when we're going to see our T-bones and our porterhouses, where they have New York strip on one side, basically, and they have that tenderloin on the other side of it, okay? So that's what you're going to see there. Let me put these legs aside and just kind of show you this as well. Now, there's one little rib attached to this, but there's also a bunch of flap meat here, right? When I kind of lay this out, there's a little bit of meat under there. It's kind of right here on the animal, right? That's the flank steak right there. That flap meat is buried in there. And I am not sure if you can see it. You can almost see the grain to the meat there. It's got really, really long fibers. Actually, it's running this way. Uh, uh, that's where that meat, or uh, that's what we want to cut across as we're doing that meat. So let me pull this piece out and that's flank steak in there. Boom, right there. This other flap in here, this is all flap meat as well.
And this is where I pull out my bavette. It's kind of a, an extension of the sirloin there, okay? So all of these different flat meats, I can kind of get in underneath them and kind of shave them out of there. Here's some flank. Boom. Again, that flank came right from here on that animal. That's a flank steak right there. You can, little membrane on the other side, let me get that off. But you can really see the green to this meat. This is a tough piece of meat if you cut it the wrong way. If you cut it across that, uh, if you cut it long way with the fibers, you've got these big, long, chewy fibers. But if you cut those fibers across very thin, you've got these tiny little fibers and it just almost melts in your mouth. Just cutting this in the wrong way will make it tough after it's been cooked, okay? Flap meat. Let's take a look at the bavette, right? Look at all this heavy, heavy flap meat in there. And I can get in there and kind of separate layers and get a ton of that very, very fibrous meat that's excellent for things like fajitas and things like that. This is all coming from, you know, that kind of sternum area, this, this thinner area that kind of uh, um, uh, uh, holds all of your organs and things like that. Flap meat. So I'm digging for bavette right now. And this is something I worked a little butcher shop for a while. This was something that was not the fun job. Skinning flap meat was not a fun job. There we go. Oops, I kind of cut into it. You guys get the idea, right? And this again, that flap meat, excellent fajitas, things like that, right? But it's got a very, very tough or um, very, very definite fiber structure in there. If you go to the other side of this, the fibers are running in this direction and they're running sideways on this direction, right? So you got to kind of separate all those flaps out, okay? So that was a little discussion of flap meat. The three flap meats I talked about were flank, skirt. I pulled the skirt out. Let me show you that one again. Where's that skirt? It was a big long piece that we pulled out and that anchored the lungs inside the animal. That's a skirt. That's another skirt. Uh, we had the flank and we had the third one was the bavette. So there's the flank. Boom. I kind of lost the little head of that. But that bavette, there's a ton of flat meat in those, those little kind of uh, abdomen cavities, if you will. Okay. We're almost done breaking this thing into primals. Just a couple more little moves here. And then I got to get all this stuff chilling for a couple hours so I can actually work on it. Okay. So again, um, there's some more flat meat on this other side that I'll clean up. Uh, this is the... Uh, loin basically. So I'll get that going in between shows. And then finally, I've got the legs here that I'm going to kind of split. I probably took them off a little far. I'm just going to, gosh, maybe just split them with my knife. And uh, later on, I'm going to bone these guys, bone one of these guys out. Okay. I'm going to bone one out and show you a semi boneless um, uh, lamb leg. Okay. I've got a little portion of bone right there that I got to take out of there. But uh, otherwise, those are your primals, your round primals on a beef or your leg primals on goat, lamb, or veal. Okay. So let me set these guys aside and let me see if I uh, covered everything I wanted to cover. I just had a couple little bullet points. Um, let's talk about this. Okay. Um, when you're buying an animal, um, I didn't see a, a blue stamp on this. Typically, when you're buying meat from America, you're going to see that blue or purplish stamp on there, right? It's, it's They use a, a food dye on that. I don't know if it's beet juice or whatever it is. But uh, um, there are different stamps. Some of the stamps are round. Some of them are shield-shaped. Uh, uh, and I wanted to talk about that stuff when you're buying meat, OK? When you see that round stamp on something, it use, usually has a big US in the center. That's It usually says inspected for wholesomeness on that stamp right? Um, that is all that stamp is telling you is that that animal is safe to eat, right? It's been inspected for wholesomeness. When you start paying the big bucks, you start seeing those shield shaped stamps on there where it says prime or choice. Those are grading stamps. And they're telling you, um, all, the only thing they're telling you is, is basically how much fat is in this animal, the fat content. Let me show you this, right? In between... Right here, in between, this is where the rib came off, and this is the loin right here, right? When we are, uh, when we, they have a carcass hanging in a, a slaughterhouse, they'll make one cut right here just to expose this muscle, and they look at the amount of fat in there. 
I mentioned earlier, goat is extremely lean and we're looking at basically a, <coughs> excuse me, basically a New York strip right there. That's the outline of a New York, okay? Um, almost no marbling in this thing whatsoever, but on a prime cow or a, I'm sorry, a prime steer, you're gonna see a ton of marbling in there. Lots and lots of that marbled fat running through that, right? So prime would be your top, uh, um, your top grade, right? The next one down would be choice. Um, it's gonna have a little less of that marbling. And this is kind of subjective, you know, depending on the, who the inspector is, but um, they take a look at the meat and they judge whether it's a prime or whether it's a choice, right? And then finally, the third one down is select. Um, typically, we don't see anything below select in, in consumer marketplaces outside of, a, if you have something that doesn't have a stamp on it at all, um, sometimes they'll call that a no roll. It just hasn't been inspected for quality. You might get a no roll um, steer or something like that. It hasn't been, nobody paid to get it inspected for quality, um, but, uh, uh, but it'll be like prime, right? It'll be prime. They just didn't pay for it to get graded, right? So um, anyway, uh, that's kind of the thing about the difference between grading and inspecting. When you see the round stamp, that's an inspection. It means it's safe to eat. When you're seeing the grading stamp, that's only on some cuts of meat. And it's usually telling, it's, it's always actually telling you about the fat content in that animal. So grading is different from inspection, okay? Um, other things to talk about, the last thing to kind of talk about, I think was, yeah, I covered everything else. Um, uh, grass fed versus, um, you know, what we would call, I guess, traditionally finished, but grass fed is traditional, right? It always just kind of blows my mind when people say that, but um, we all know about corn fed beef and corn finished beef and things like that, right? It's kind of the, uh, uh, what we call commodity beef. It's what we see in most grocery stores. Um, that is um, basically, it's, it's been raised on grass all of its life. I mean, all cows are grass fed. You can call almost anybody grass fed, but when they get to the end of a, a, a steer's life, they are taking it to this high density feed lot where they're gonna fatten that guy up and, until he reaches slaughter weight, right? And so in the last few weeks of his life, they're putting together this, this slurry basically of, it, 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 people think it's all corn, right? But it's more of a slurry of different things like corn and alfalfa and they pour in molasses to make it taste really good. So they just can't stop eating it. And, you know, they add, you know, they pour in a bunch of like Flintstone vitamins in there and everything, right? It's got all of everything a growing cow needs, right? Um, so uh, they, they basically stick them in these feedlots and just cram them full of that stuff. And they're putting on all of this basically artificial fat, basically, in their last days of their life. And it really, really increases that marbling and all of that good stuff that, that Americans love, okay? Um, when you're looking at, uh, if you're looking at, if you want grass-fed animals, you want to look at an animal that is grass finished as well, right? An animal that has never seen a grain of corn. They've never seen those feedlots and, and places like that, right? And so that's typically what people are kind of talking about. You'll see organic listed on a label with, with some meats, right? And that organic designation, well, it's, it's been changed many times over the years, but basically what you're looking at is that animal is, is not getting any feed that has pesticides, chemical fertilizers, um, uh, any of that, that uh, uh, no GMOs basically, right? Any of that, that new tech, right? It's it's all natural, uh, uh, none of those things kind of come into play, right? And so those animals are just eating grass basically or natural silage, you know, hogs, they're, they're not grass fed, but you know, they're eating things like, you know, um, crops and things like that, you know, they grow crops for them and, and things like that, right? And so, and they will eat corn too. Hogs will pretty much eat anything, right? Um, but uh, uh, basically those are, those are kind of some of the terms you run into when you see natural, I guess uh, that natural term comes up. Um, that, that is one that it, it can mean anything, right? Um, uh, it's kind of tough to do that organic, uh, um, designation on your product, especially on your animals that you're growing. Oftentimes, uh, um, ranchers just don't see the, uh, the, 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 the benefit of it, right? And so they wind up just raising their animals in, a right, in the right way, you know, grass fed, grass finished, all of that. Um, you can have the most natural animals out there, but they won't have that government organic label on them just because they don't want to go through all the hoops to, to get designated with that. So um, oftentimes that organic label, it can be a good thing. Uh, it can me be meaningless, right? A lot of big corporations get that organic label and their stuff is pretty far from natural. So it's all kind of buyer beware out there. Knowing your source is a good thing. That's why I like to, um, as my good friend, Eric B. Miller at the uh, uh, butcher shop I used to work at, B. Miller Meats, um, as he says, um, we should be shortening the chain. And I love the way he puts that right. Thinking about um, uh, taking links out of that food supply chain, getting to know where our meats come from, getting to know that farmer and getting it at, in the most direct 
way that you possibly can, whether it's from a butcher shop that works directly with a farm, with a rancher, or whether it's at a farmer's market where the ranchers are coming there and you're actually meeting them and talking to them and all that wonderful stuff. You're removing those stay, those links in the chain in between you and your food. And it's always, always going to be a good thing. Okay. So what did we do this morning? We kind of talked about um, what the day is going to entail. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, the primals on goats, on lamb, on veal, and we also talk about the primals on beef animals as well, right? Um, we uh, The primals on beef were chuck, chuck up here, followed by the rib area, okay? Um, followed by the loin area, let me adjust that, followed by the loin area down here, and then my round right there, okay? On the uh, uh, veal, goat, and lamb, it was shoulder, it was rack, it was loin, this whole thing was the loin, and then you had a leg at the bottom, okay? And by the way, if you're interested in pork, I could be a hog as well, right? Uh, hog primals, the jowl is sometimes called a primal, but it's really more of a subprimal. Um, you get up here, it sounds funny, but on a hog, this is the butt, it's the shoulder, okay? The shoulder is the butt. Um, uh, the forearm is called a picnic shoulder or a picnic ham. Then you've got one big primal running all the way down there. It's not like a rib and a loin. It's all just called the loin. So on a hog, this is all one piece back there. And then this is all one big piece called the belly. That's where your bacon and ribs are all from. And then finally, the back leg on a hog is called a ham. It's not called a butt. Who, who would have thunk, right? So um, those are all the primals with a bunch of animals. We talked about a couple of little, uh, we talked about flap meats. I took out a tenderloin and kind of broke him into a filet, uh, uh, a Chateaubriand, and also a couple of little medallions, okay, medallion. Um, and uh, also called noisettes, by the way, the medallions can also be called noisettes. Um, let's see, we talked about inspection, inspections versus grading on meat, uh, just kind of just uh, talking about those stamps and things like that. We um, talked about, tough cuts of meat versus non-tough cuts of meat. And we're gonna continue that conversation this afternoon when I start breaking into some of these bigger cuts. And uh, let's see, and then we finally talk about, you know, organic and natural and grass fed. We just kind of basically touched on that stuff and everything. Um, let's see, I um, let me go through here and see if there's any questions before we kind of sign off. Um, let's see, we are going up to the top, lamb, goat, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, I think, uh, I wish I could buy a goat locally. Yeah, we just talked about it. I just got it at uh, at Restaurant Depot, but um, I might, I'm, I'm kind of working on getting a goat uh, person. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a goat person. Let's see, I'm not seeing any other questions. I remember you tossing me a goat's head at Charles. Oh, that was somebody else. Oh, maybe it wasn't, I don't know. I tossed somebody a goat head, Mr. Burt. I must have done that. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Uh, let's see, I don't see any other questions here. I must have tossed somebody a goat head though at some point. That's not very nice. There's the question about goat head. I've always wanted to make a goat stew or curry. Yeah, it's, um, gosh, goat really lends itself well to those um, uh, like curry type dishes, the Middle Eastern spice blends and things like that. I mean, you think about where goats come from originally. They were one of the first animals that we raised, right? That was the beginning of society, the dawn of society. Goats were right there with us every step of the way. Uh, let's see, I am looking for more questions. I don't see any more questions. Guys, I think I'm gonna call it a morning. We are gonna be back here at four o'clock and we're gonna start breaking down some of these cuts uh, to show you a little bit more steaks and things like that. It's gonna be really, really fun. You're gonna see the cutest little steaks ever. So uh, go ahead and tune in. If you don't know, my name is Dave Nelson and I'm here with Industry Cooking Classes and we are doing a quarantine kitchen happy hour today at four o'clock and I'm gonna be breaking down the rest of this goat. Thanks a lot for coming. If you are interested, go check out my industry cooking classes channel over on YouTube. So subscribe while you're there and uh, see if you can pick up a free tchotchke at the gift store. Okay. All right. Uh, don't forget everybody. I'll be back at four and in between now and then uh, the party is always, always in the kitchen. We'll see you at four guys. I am fired up for this. I'm having fun. This is good stuff. <laughs>